Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Irfan, for that uh, lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to at least half of it. And it uh, makes it doubly uh, harder to follow Judith uh, because uh, she said so much of what I wanted to say better than me. So I guess that's why she was in PR and I'm a mere journalist. So there you go. <laughs> So I want to start off, I want to uh, first give a shout out to Health Quality Ontario, uh, just for making such an effort to making the conference accessible to, to patients and to families, and to make it not only accessible but affordable. I think there's not enough conferences that do that, so uh, I commend them for that to start off with. And of course, I want to thank all of you for being here in such large numbers. Uh, I'm not a big fan of pro sports myself, but I understand there's something going on at this dome building next door. So uh, as I was walking here, I heard all these young men talking about, uh, I don't know, balls and stuff, and I thought it was maybe testicular cancer screening. I don't, I, so, but anyhow, something going on there. You can go there after. I'll try and be brief. So, so let me talk about uh, the topic of interest to this audience, I hope. Patient-centered care. That's what I want to spend my time talking about. Uh, the term gets bandied about a lot. And as you heard from Judith, we've been talking about it forever. We haven't been doing it for so long. Uh, so what, what does it really mean? What does the term mean? Uh, will it make the health system safer or more cost-effective if we're patient-centered? Uh, should it be a priority given all the things we need to do in healthcare? Uh, if so, what are the trade-offs? What do we have to give up if we want to be more patient-centered? Uh, can we actually move beyond rhetoric to action on this question? So those are some of the, the juicy questions I want to tackle in the next little while. Uh, you know, I'm going to start with a little bit of theory, give you some definitions, a little bit of academic stuff. Uh, then I want to spend some time talking about, and most of my time actually, talking about practicalities. What does it really mean for patients? Uh, how does our health system need to change if it really wants to become patient-centered? Uh, what reforms and innovations are required uh, at the systems level, the big picture stuff? And most of all, most importantly of all, what, what does it mean on the front lines? Uh, how do frontline providers need to change to become more patient-centered? And, and how do patients need to change to, to make the system work? differently. So that's a lot to, to wade into. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just address a couple of technical points. Uh, you'll notice by this point that uh, there's no PowerPoint running, and I'm not actually fumbling and sweating, wondering what's wrong. Uh, so it's not a technical failure, it's actually a choice. So like uh, Judith, I decided I'm just going to stand up here and talk. And I do this for a couple of reasons, and not strictly because I'm a Luddite, although I may be. Uh, I do this for a couple of, uh, I think, good reasons. One is I spend a lot of time at conferences, and I find that the technology is, is overused and it's abused, much like technology is in healthcare. We, we overuse it when we don't have to. I also think that the key to good care, to patient-centered care, is communication. And you've probably heard that word over and over today, how key it is to communicate. You know, good old-fashioned talking and listening is what makes, what distinguishes good healthcare from mediocre healthcare, at least in my opinion. So I want to practice what I preach. I know that patients, when they're at the bedside, don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm not going to use one talking to you about these practicalities. Uh, and I guess if you want to look at it in a more academic way, I'm, pra I'm uh, staging my one-man choosing wisely campaign, and I'm choosing not to use PowerPoint. So I, I hope others will follow my, my, my lead. Uh, now, secondly, you often hear at conferences, you hear speakers say, can you turn off your phones and stuff? And I'm not going to do that. I like to do the opposite. I encourage people to turn on their phones and their iPads and their computers, whatever they want to use, and to bring other people into the conversation virtually through social media. So if you want to post, post to Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or Tumblr, whatever your social media of choice is, please feel free to do so. I, I'm a journalist, so quote me or misquote me as you will. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, as you might know, my social media of choice is Twitter. You've heard a few references to that. So I'm Picard on Health uh, on Twitter. And as you probably know by now, there's a hashtag uh, called HQT2015 for this conference. So, you know, and if you want to stream the baseball game, I'll take no offense at that either. So. So let me wade into the, the, the meat of the topic. Uh, the US Institute of Medicine defines patient-centered care as follows. Care that is respectful, respectful and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. Uh, I think that's a nice and all-encompassing and inspiring definition. Uh, it really means everything and it means nothing. Good academic definition. 
Uh, you've probably heard the expression, uh, I don't know anything about art, but I know what I like. And that's how I feel about patient-centered care. Uh, I think it's a, it's a bit like that. You don't, it's hard to define it precisely, but you know it when you experience it. Or more to the point, you know it when you don't experience it, when it's not patient-centered. And probably everyone in the audience has several examples of this from their lives. So you can't necessarily articulate all the characteristics of patient-centered care, and you can't just create an app and magically make the system patient-centered. Uh, but, but you can get a sense of it, and you, ha you do know how to get there in the journey, to use that overused term. Uh, I, in my work, visit lots of hospitals. I visit hun visited hundreds of hospitals in Canada, the US, Europe, in the developing world. And over time, I've developed a pretty good sense, I, I think I have a pretty good sense of the quality of care offered by an institution within about five minutes of walking in the front door. I don't have to watch surgery or read the reports or anything. Uh, first impressions often are quite correct. They give you a sense of a culture of a place. Uh, and it's not the physical surroundings that matter so much, because I've been to rundown hospitals in, in Uganda and in Rwanda, uh, you know, that are scary, but they do offer good care, because you see it in the healthcare workers. And personally, what do I look for? I, I look for the demeanor of the staff more than anything else. Uh, that, to me, is more important than any uh, fancy report card. Uh, personally, I want to be cared for in a hospital where the staff actually looks you in the eyes. I, I think nothing is more important. It, says, it speaks volumes. Uh, I don't want to be in a place where they shine the sh their shoes with their eyes every time a patient walks by. Well, I don't want to have a contact that might engender in, in more work or something unpleasant, like talking to a person. Um, I want to be treated in a hospital where the staff says, can I help you? where they go out of their way to say that, when you're looking lost or confused or scared, or you're sitting alone in a corner. Uh, I want to be treated in a hospital where the CEO is on the floor of the hospital every single day, interacting with patients and interacting with staff, because that stuff really matters. The personal touch matters. Now, all this to say that, to me, patient-centered care, more than anything else, is about a culture. It's about a culture of empathy. And you've heard this again and again, and you heard it very eloquently from, from Judith. Uh, I think in many ways the concept is more easily expressed in aphorisms, maybe than, more than definitions. And you're prob probably familiar with a lot of these slogans. Again, you've heard some of them through the day, and you've seen them in your healthcare journeys. Um, the needs of the patient come first. That's the tagline of the, the famous Mayo Clinic. Every patient is the only patient. Uh, I saw that carved above the front entrance of the hospital at Harvard University. Nothing about me without me. That's become the rallying cry of patient groups around the world. And I don't know the exact origin of that phrase. Uh, personally, I, I heard it first from uh, Dave de Bronckhart, who some of you may know as e-patient Dave, who's really a, a mover and shaker in that uh, in patient-centered care. Uh, another description of patient-centered care I've heard is a more esoteric one, uh, giving a patient a better day. And I actually like that one. Uh, I like that one because when all is said and done, that, that's what healthcare is all about. It's making patients feel a little bit better, not curing them, not magically saving them, helping them live forever, but making them feel a little better in that time and place. And those little gestures, as you hear time and time again, are what matters. Now, all these things I've enumerated, like many aspirations in healthcare, are a lot easier to say than they are to do. They're a lot easier to promise than to deliver. But we have to work at them, and we have to work at them slowly and relentlessly. Now, maybe a better way to understand patient-centered care, because I was unhappy when I tried to come up with the definitions and explanations, I thought maybe a better way to articulate it is to say what it isn't. Because as I said, we know when we're not getting patient-centered care. So what do patients dislike about being in the health system? Aside from being sick, everybody hates being sick, that's a given, but what else bothers them the most? And from my experience, and I'm speaking from, uh, not as a journalist, but more as a, a child of two parents with long-term chronic illnesses, that really was my health education more than anything else. In my experience, there's a number of things that patients dislike uh, that really bother them. Uh, the helplessness is number one. Uh, the feeling of anonymity is feeling like a number rather than a person. The discontinuity of care, 
falling between the cracks uh, when you move around. The rote and the repetition, especially repeating your history. Uh, being talked about and talked to rather than being talked with. And you'll see all of these are about communication. They're, that's really essential. Now in my work, I'm lucky, I'm privileged, I get to talk to a lot of patients, and I've done so for decades. And the most common feeling I think they have is, is fear. There's a lot of fear and trepidation when you're sick. Uh, we all fear becoming patients. And why is that? Uh, it's usually a scary leap into the unknown. You don't know what awaits you. But what you do know awaits you is this lack of control and this isolation that can be quite frightening. I think all the feelings, all the worries I've enumerated, again, have two common causes. Uh, they stem from the fact that our system is fragmented, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, and also from poor communication. Just being able to talk and listen would en eliminate so many of these daily problems so easily, and at no cost, I might add. So for me, patient-centered care means never feeling alone. And that's what we should strive for. A patient should never feel alone and abandoned. But the fact is that I think almost all patients in our system do routinely feel alone. And they feel lonely. And that's a really good indication that we're doing something wrong or that we're not doing care good enough. So we have this elaborate, sprawling health system. We spend $215 billion a year delivering health care in Canada. Uh, we have all kinds, all manner of technology and health professionals. It's all wonderful. Uh, but if we want the system to be patient-centered, we have to first figure out where the patient fits into that big maze. And I don't think we've quite figured that out. Again, as Judah said, things are tremendously better than they have been in the last 10, 20, or 30 years. I've been around 30 years. Uh, things are infinitely better today, but they're still not good enough. Now, where does the patient fit in? There's a broad view, range of views on this. Uh, there's a spectrum that ranges from radical consumerism, this belief that the patient is God, or if you prefer, that the customer is always right, right through to a, a more classic uh, view of professionalism, or I think a more accurate term is paternalism, which holds that medical professionals uh, have to use their knowledge to give patients what's best for them, you know, and in many cases protect them from themselves. So that's quite a broad range. Uh, personally, I have a clear bias. Uh, I write and I speak from a consumer perspective. Now, I do this because I think there's a clear power imbalance in a healthcare system between providers and patients. And I think people like me who have the privilege of having a bully pulpit uh, should use it to first and foremost convey the needs and the wants of patients because healthcare professionals are able to express their views and needs much more readily. Now, having said that, I want to be clear that I don't think patient-centeredness means uh, simply giving patients everything they want when they want it. That's not patient-centered. That's, that's just foolish. Uh, healthcare is not an all-you-can-eat buffet, and it shouldn't be. Uh, but it's not a military exercise either. Uh, we shouldn't expect patients to unquestionably follow orders. Uh, somewhere between those two extremes is a sweet spot. Uh, you know, the sweet spot that we should call patient-centered care. And how do you get there? You get there with partnership, with sharing of information, with exchange of opinions, and above all, with mutual respect. And again, there's not enough respect either way in our daily interactions in healthcare. Now, all those things I've just enumerated are the characteristics that you want in a, a provider-patient relationship and in a system-patient relationship. But while all, all those ideals sound great on paper, again, they can be really difficult to achieve. There's tens of thousands of interactions every single day, millions a year. We're not going to get them all right. And there's a whole academic literature in this. How do we do shared decision-making properly? Uh, you know, it's so complex and it's so vast. How do we do it? Uh, I think healthcare providers need to act in the best interest of patients. There's no question about that. But patients often have a view of what's best for them that's radically different from that of their providers uh, and from their medical teachings. Uh, shared decision-making is more than agreeing to disagree. That's not going to result in good care. Uh, it's a lot dirtier and messier than that to find compromises and to find the right final decision. 
Uh, it's about finding a compromise that respects both medical responsibility and patient autonomy. And those are two things that should not be at odds, but that are hard to find a common ground. And I think it's a delicate dance that we're going to have to master if we truly want quality patient-centered care. And you can't have one without the other. Now, a few minutes ago, I spoke about patients' fears and frustrations. Uh, so I want to flip the coin a bit and talk about the, the other side of that equation. What are the worries of healthcare professionals about healthcare, about patient-centered care? And they do have worries, no, make no bones about it. Um, doctors and nurses, like patients, fear one thing. They fear a loss of control. You know, uh, what if we give too much to the patient and we lose our, our say, our autonomy? What we need to remember, though, is what I said a few minutes ago, that there's a tremendous power imbalance uh, between physicians and patients and nurses and patients and other healthcare providers and patients. Uh, there's no question that if we are going to deliver patient-centered care, health professionals are going to have to put some water in their wine. There's going to have to be some giving up of power, and willingly, I think. Uh, there's going to have to... Uh, no, let me, stay, let me take a minute, because I'm talking about health professionals giving up some power, so let me take a minute to talk about uh, what profession means, because that, I think that's important. We talk about professionals all the time, and I think it's important to understand what that means for this discussion. So a profession is a group that reserves to itself the authority to judge the quality of its own work. So they're very autonomous. Uh, society gives professions, like physicians, this authority uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, altruism. Uh, we have a belief that those who are in the healing and caring professions, like nurses and doctors, uh, will put the interests of patients first. So that's an expectation. Uh, they have expertise. There's a recognition that thanks to many years of training and education, health professionals have skills and knowledge that are not available to non-professionals and to patients. And flowing from this, is a respect for the motives and the skills of professionals. Uh, they're afforded this privilege of self-regulation, which few in society have. Uh, health professionals police each other, and we give almost no one else in society that right. Now, the reason I want to elaborate on this a bit is to point out how the interactions between patients and healthcare providers are very different from virtually every other interaction in our lives. Because often we talk about uh, medicine as a commercial interaction, and I don't think it's that simple. Uh, healthcare is one area where clients or customers or patients, whatever you want to call them, are so beholden to the skills of the provider uh, that it's the only area where they're not the final authority to judge their own needs most of the time. And they're often not the, able to judge the quality of service. That's not true of any other of our interactions in, in daily life. Uh, healthcare is also the only area in our consumer society where we're only allowed to have wants. Uh, or sorry, only allowed to have needs and not wants. We have all kinds of wants in our daily lives, but in healthcare we seem to be restricted to only having needs. Uh, and that's especially true, I think, in a, in a publicly funded system like Canada's. So health is an area where the patient, client, uh, pre uh, whatever you want to call them again, have very little choice. And that again makes the, the interaction very special. And I want to be careful here not to overstate the importance of choice because we often say, oh, if we only had choice, everything would be better in healthcare. But we have to remember that most patients or many patients don't have the ability or the desire to shop around for health services. They're usually at a, in, a, in a state where they can't do that and the system doesn't lend itself to that. And care would not necessarily be better if we had more choice. So in other words, choice is often illusory. And again, uh, I don't, I'm not convinced that having a lot more choices would necessarily make, choice, uh, would necessarily make care more patient-centered. So that was a little aside on professionalism. I hope it wasn't too, too technical. So let me return to the, the issue I was talking about. Uh, what do doctors and nurses and other health professionals fear when people like me uh, get up and say, you know, patients need more power, they need more autonomy, our system needs to be no, more democratic. Uh, what do they think when people like me get up and say, you know, the needs of the patients have to trump the needs of the professional? Uh, obviously, it makes them nervous. Uh, they fear that evidence-based medicine is going to have to take a backseat to patient-knows-best medicine. And I'm not sure that's true. Uh, 
you know, the goals of patients often differ from the goals of providers. And that's okay. Uh, if we're going to have shared decision making, what we have to have first and foremost is agreement on goals. And once you have goals, it's a lot easier to agree on how to have a treatment plan. But I think that's something we often forget about to ask in healthcare is what is the goal of the patient? It's not necessarily to be cured or to be better uh, magically or whatever. Uh, sometimes they just want a better, easier life. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a few minutes. Uh, a fully informed and competent patient should be able to refuse care or demand a second opinion or ha a d ask for a different approach to care. But uh, what I said there, being fully informed is important and we don't do a good job of informing and educating patients. Uh, we don't have times for conversations and for discussing of alternatives. Uh, we rush things a lot. Uh, we have a very rigid way of delivering care. We have standard procedures, guidelines, restrictions. Uh, one of the things that's said the most often in our healthcare interactions, and again, you heard this from Judith, is, you know, those are the rules. That's how things are done. Uh, sit down and wait. Do what you're told. It's an attitude that is not patient friendly. Now, I'm not suggesting that the rules are always unhelpful or unnecessary. Uh, sometimes they are. But I'm saying we tend to enforce arbitrary rules rigidly, and that benefits no one. It doesn't benefit patients or providers. Now, every one of you here can probably cite 10 examples of these. Uh, they may not all be Kafkaesque, like Judas' examples, but everybody has these examples. So let me give you one from my, my life recently. Uh, let's take a, a theoretical patient, me. Uh, and someone has a sore foot, a chronically sore foot, they get it looked at, they have doctor's appointments, and they can't figure anything out. So finally it's decided uh, you need, to, ec need a, to have an x-ray, it might be a fracture, a stress fracture or something. So you get your appointment, you get your x-ray, and a couple of days later the clinic calls you and they say, oh the results are available. You say, great, what are they? Oh, we can't tell you over the phone, we have rules. So you hobble into the clinic, and they tell you, oh, your foot is fractured, you need a cast. And you say, great, let's do it. Oh, no, no, you have to book an appointment and come back. Those are the rules. So then you hobble back again and you say, you know, why couldn't you just tell me over the phone I had a fracture and book me for a cast? Well, because those are the rules. But that's a digression. I could do a whole other talk called Those Are the Rules. But I, I think you're getting my drift. Uh, we have to just be a little more sensible and practical. And again, the system doesn't always lend itself to that. And we have to overcome the, the status that's in the system. And that's status, S-T-A-T-I-S, for those of you who are wordsmiths. Um, now, the, f the second fear of health professionals is an extension of the first one that I talked about. Uh, the cost of giving patients more power. We expect physicians in particular, but health, other healthcare providers to a certain extent, to be stewards of our healthcare resources. We put a lot of responsibilities on their back about spending. And doctors especially feel that that power and responsibility could slip away from them if care is too patient-centered. Uh, now the most common response I hear from physicians when I discuss the notion of patient-centered care is a variation on this comment. Well, you can't give everyone an MRI who asks for one. You know, patients are going to be crazy. They're going to ask for all kinds of crazy stuff if you, let, if you give them any power. And I, I for one, am not convinced that's true. Uh, I think that belief is based on the, the largely false premise that, that patients are, well, for lack of a better term, wasteful idiots. Or, you know, at least more wasteful idiots than doctors. These things all being relative, of course. Uh, you know, I think there's no question that in our system there's a lot of overtreatment, there's some undertreatment, there's some mistreatment. Uh, there's a lot of ways we could do, be doing things better in our system. By, by any estimates, by many estimates, about 30% of all care that we deliver is not helpful. So that's about $60 billion a year in waste, if you want to do the math. So we can definitely do things uh, better. And you again heard some eloquent examples of this this morning from uh, Danielle Martin. But all this to say, I'm not convinced giving patients more power will necessarily make things worse. Now, of course, there are going to be a, a small minority of patients who are venal or who make unreasonable demands, but they are going to be a tiny minority. And you don't make rules, especially bureaucratic rules, and create huge barriers to interaction just to deal with a troublesome few. You have to just deal with them separately.
I think patients can bring a lot of useful knowledge to their care, but they can only do so if they're given the opportunity to do so, to participate. And again, that's what we're talking about with patient-centered care. Uh, in my experience, most patients are actually quite reasonable. Uh, if anything, Canadians are not demanding enough of their care kind of just a little bit too receptive and accepting of, of things like weights and being told what to do. Uh, they take advice well. Uh, sometimes I think they take it even too well. They don't question it enough. What we want is, is something else. We want a partnership. We want an effective partnership. And again, for that to be able to happen, patients have to be educated and informed. And they also have to take responsibility. So the third side of my three-sided coin is that, that patients really do have to be responsible. And we don't talk about that enough, and I think that's an important part of the equation. But they have to have the power and the ability to do that. Um, we don't make it easy for patients to get unbiased, credible information. And they certainly can't have conversations when we have seven-minute fee-for-service appointments. That's not going to happen. And they're certainly not going to have casual conversations if they're kept waiting five hours past their appointed uh, time for their, their, their meeting or their appointment. Now, let me talk about one last fear of health professionals. And it's that their needs and their wants will be ignored even more than they are now, again, if we give more power to patients. Um, Put another way, they worry that there's going to be more time, demands on their time and their energy, more responsibility, and they're not going to be remunerated for doing so. And I think that's a legitimate fear. I think we have to be careful that patient-centeredness doesn't become a code for getting health professionals to do more work for less pay. And we have to talk about these things openly. Uh, but does patient-centered care mean the subjugation of doctors and nurses? I don't think it does. I think it'll, it means ultimately a, a richer, more interesting way of practicing medicine. So I want to say a little bit more about the, the physician-patient relationship at the end, but before I do, uh, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the system, because all of this stuff I talked about uh, is at the front lines. Patients need to change, doctors need to change, uh, the culture needs to change. If for any of that to happen, we need a system that allows it. We need a system that's smarter and more modern. Uh, the fundamental problem we have in our healthcare system is that it's out of date. Uh, it was fashioned in the 1950s and 60s for a population that was young and healthy, and now we're trying to treat a population that's older and has a lot of chronic illnesses. So we have this constant uh, square peg into a round hole every day. So we need to fix that structure before any of this other practical stuff is going to happen. Uh, so what needs to be fixed? I want to go over uh, five things fairly quickly, because if any of you read my columns or if you've heard me speak before, I tend to rant on about these issues a lot, so I just want to summarize them very briefly. But in short, what it's all about is, you know, dragging Medicare, uh, kicking and screaming if need be, into the 21st century to create a structure that allows a more democratic uh, interaction between patients and providers. And, you know, there are two fundamental things we have to address, and that's delivery of services and funding. So let's start with the most important one, uh, delivery. How, how do we make the structure of the system more patient-centered? Uh, first of all, I think we have to address primary care. Uh, we need to essentially take our hospital-based system and turn it on its head. Uh, we have to make primary uh, community-based care the focus. Uh, we have to move away from our acute episodic model of care uh, to this chronic care model. Uh, to do that, you need to give every patient a medical home, whether it's a physician, a nurse practitioner, a clinic, or whatever, as a central coordinating point for their care, and then uh, have a system that follows them through their life uh, that's well coordinated. So coordination is really key. And then delivering care in teams, interdisciplinary teams, rather than individual practitioners. Uh, number two is drugs, and we're hearing a lot about this uh, <clears throat> during the election, about the need for pharma care. And there's no question we need to extend our universal uh, health coverage plan to prescription drugs. You know, right now we have this patchwork of drug plans that covers about 27 million Canadians, but it means that 6 million Canadians don't have universal Medicare. And that's, I think, should concern us a great deal uh, for a country that's so proud of its Medicare system. Now, 
I'm not suggesting that every single prescription drug from A to Z has to be covered for everyone, but we have to find a way of making uh, drugs uh, affordable and accessible to everyone who needs them. Uh, third point, home care. You know, we need to treat people where they live if we want to have a patient-centered system. Uh, we need to treat them in the community, not necessarily in large institutions. Now, a lot of people worry, well, that's too expensive. Well, it's only expensive if, uh, you know, it's an add-on. But we, if we replace a lot of our institutional care with home care, we can make it work. Uh, social determinants. Uh, we don't talk enough about the other stuff that makes us healthy and unhealthy. You know, we need to invest more in prevention efforts, uh, particularly for the socially disadvantaged and marginalized groups like Aboriginal people. Uh, we have to stop pretending that health is merely a medical issue. Uh, medicine is often the least of it. Uh, education, housing, income, uh, the physical environment, all these things are essential to having a healthy population. And we need a whole of government approach to health care, not just this isolated providing of sickness care through our, our medical system. Uh, the final point, quality, very appropriate for this conference. Uh, safe, prompt and effective must be the guiding principles for care delivery, above all. If you don't have those, you don't have patient-centered care. Uh, for the most part, <coughs> these are engineering and administrative issues. They're not medical issues. Uh, we do healthcare really well in this country. We do the, we're excellent plumbers, but we do a bad job of moving people around, of guiding them through the system, uh, of taking care uh, that they don't fall through the cracks. That's where we really have to focus a lot of effort, uh, getting the quality of the whole treatment right and not just this little patchwork of isolated uh, islands of excellence. So that's a lot to do to reform healthcare. But again, if we don't do that, we're not going to have the ability to do change those frontline interactions. Now, the, the delivery part is the easy part. Uh, we also have to change, we have to do something about funding. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, because I think the whole uh, private-public debate is a bit of a false dichotomy. Uh, I think we just have to just say a couple of quick words on that. I think we have to accept that uh, if we have a public insurance plan, it's not going to cover everything. Uh, it's going to cover the basics. But we have to define what that means. What do we mean by the basics? Uh, those uh, who oversee the system have to recognize that our current way of having insurance, public insurance, covering only physician and hospital care, is not sufficient for the current population, for our current demographic. So we need to expand into areas that Medicare covers, uh, that Medicare covers, things like drugs, home care, long-term care that I've mentioned, while at the same time limiting coverage across the board to the essentials. So how do you do that? Well, universal coverage is not a synonym for unlimited open-ended coverage. Uh, we have to make choices and tough choices, uh, including defining quite clearly what's covered by Medicare and what's not. Again, as, as most European countries do, much better than us. And above all, we have to start paying for what works and paying for results rather than paying for volume. And again, if we don't do these things, it's not going to be patient-centered. Um, this is all big picture stuff, and I wish we were discussing it more during the election campaign, and we're not. And you might be wondering, well, all, what does all this have to do with the topic at hand? But again, I think if we're going to discuss patient-centered care, uh, it can't be all about relationships, individual provider-patient relationships. Uh, in every, every time you're in a room uh, having an intimate discussion about your health, there's actually a third party in the room. And the third party in that room is the payer, it's the taxpayer. And this matters. Uh, we pay for health care uh, through p both public uh, premiums, which are our taxes, and private premiums. And we pay a lot of money each year. As I said, $215 billion. Uh, if we have a health insurance scheme that's unaffordable and a health system that's financially unsustainable, it's by definition not patient-centered because it's not going to last. So we have to create this system in which we can deliver quality care and once we do that, only then can we talk more about the nitty-gritty of making it more patient-centered. So I'm almost out of time. So before I wrap up, I just want to touch on one more area. As I said, I want to come back to the bedside and to the front lines and talk a little bit more about practical stuff about what this means to patients. 
And I'll, I'll finish off by, uh, if you will, uh, allow me to use my mum as an example. So my mum was someone who suffered from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for a long time. Uh, she was one of those little old ladies that you saw walking around Walmart with an oxygen tank. And there's a lot of them. So she had a lot of interactions with the healthcare system. Uh, if you have COPD, you're susceptible to infections, you have heart problems, and like her, you eventually suffer a series of, of strokes from uh, poor blood clotting, and you falls and dementia, and, and so on, because of lack of oxygen to the brain. So overall, my mother, like most Canadians, had wonderful care. When you're in the right place at the right time, the care in Canada is second to none. But she also, like most Canadians in the health system, had many frustrations. And the most irritating one, above all, was having to repeat her history. Uh, every time she went to a hospital or to a new doctor, because there was no electronic health record, and she had a health file that was about uh, six inches thick, a paper file, and no one in their right mind would read that. So she just had to repeat things over and over. Uh, but what bothered her the, the most, or most persistently, was that so few health care providers actually asked her what she wanted. They had all kinds of recommendations and suggestions to make her life better, new treatments, all kinds of stuff she could try. But they never said, well, what's important to you? What's, how do you want your care to be better? What can we do for you? And I think that's a question that every single interaction should start with. What can we do for you? What do you want? Uh, my mom was provided with all manner of equipment, drugs, and care. Uh, you know, I can't imagine how much money it cost, and we're thankful every day for, for Medicare. But not enough effort was put into address her, addressing her fears rather than the results of her blood tests and her oxygen tests. <clears throat> and my mom, like many patients her age, had one overwhelming fear, and that was the fear of falling. A lot of elderly people fear falling down. Uh, falling down, hurting themselves, being trapped alone in their homes, it, it's a dreadful feeling. And I remember having a discussion with a doctor uh, going to one of our appointments with her. And this doctor, he was very proud. He was proud because after many months of trying, he finally had my mum's blood pressure in a good range. Uh, meanwhile, my mum was sitting there and she was miserable. She was miserable be well, because these new drugs that he had put her on made her dizzy and they made her prone to falling. Uh, that doctor failed to understand what was truly important. It wasn't the measures that he was writing down on the chart. It was how the patient was living her life. He failed to deliver patient-centered care by not asking the patient what was important. And I think, again, this happens far too often. Uh, it's not about delivering the best care on paper. It's about delivering the best care for that patient at that time, uh, based on their needs and based on their real-life circumstance. And again, that's a really big challenge. And it challenges your ability to say, listen, I'm not going to do everything I can do. I'm going to do what's important to this one person. So in that vein, I want to finish by offering a, a few little cheeky examples of how we could make patient-centered care uh, or make care more patient-centered. And here's a list of 10 innovations that could be implemented today at no cost. And again, they're cheeky, they're minor things, but I want to send the message that you know, there's a lot of little things we can do to get ourselves on this journey to a patient-centered system. So I'm going to go through them quickly. Uh, number one, no restrictions on hospital visiting hours. Uh, hospital patients should be able to decide what they wear because everyone hates those flimsy gowns, no question. Uh, patients and families should be able to participate in rounds when and if they wish. Uh, medical records we should be clear, belong to patients. If healthcare providers want to consult them, they should be asking permission of the patients, not vice versa. Uh, decision, shared decision-making tools should be the norm in every interaction. That stuff should be taught in medical school and nursing school. Uh, booking appointments online should be routine. It shouldn't be a fantasy. Uh, we should all learn the value of silence, the value of listening. Uh, one study famously showed that physicians, on average, interrupt a patient after 24 seconds. There's a lot to be said for silence and just asking, what do you need today? I think we have to abandon the term non-compliance. It's one of the terms I hate the most in medicine. Uh, if patients are not following uh, recommended instructions, figure out why they're not doing it and fix it. Don't blame the patient. And finally, 
make parking affordable. And it's funny, in, in 30 years about writing about healthcare, there's no complaint that I hear more often than the cost of parking. It's shocking, but there you have. We have the benefit of complaining about that in Canada. Now, if you're counting, I've only made nine points. That's because journalists are bad at math. Uh, but also, my point here is to stress that little things matter the most. And I think that's an important message that Judas delivered very eloquently as well. Uh, Patient-centered care, and this is my 10th and final point, Patient-centered care is ultimately about values. It's about valuing the patient as a person, not just a collection of symptoms or a chart or a number or a success or failure for the treating physician. As I said at the outset, it's about culture and empathy. And the first and perhaps most important step in changing a culture is doing exactly what you're all doing here today. It's recognizing the need to change, uh, getting together to talk about it, and working bit by bit at changing things, even when there's exciting sporting events beckoning. <clears throat> so I want to thank you again for being here, and thank you for listening, and I look forward to your feedback, and uh, if there's time for questions, I'm game. If not, uh, you know where the Sky Dome is. Yeah.